So, but there's a lot of material, so we'll get we'll get going, and I'll try to uh, get through it a little faster, so we can have a nice discussion at the end. So let's start out with the prayer. So what I'm doing with the prayers is I'm finding some. Uh, I've got a book of John and Charles Wesley quotes, and a lot of them are from obscure. Some of the hymnals we hymns we know, and some we don't know. So I'm using those for our prayers, our reflections, and just, uh, for opening and closing. So we'll we'll start off with that. Okay, so I will read, read this out for everybody. God of almighty love, by whose sufficient grace I lift my heart to things above, and humbly seek thy face. Through Jesus Christ the just, my faint desires receive, and let me in thy goodness trust, and to thy glory live. Let us pray. Dear Lord, as we gather today to learn more about our past and we go through a particularly difficult period in our past and we learn about some of the mistakes um, we've made in our tradition but also uh, how we've worked to rectify them over the years we pray that we can take that spirit going forward as we as a church is always facing um, conflicts and you know splits and uh, let this but let this study assure us that uh, that God is always with us as long as we keep faithful to, um, to our faith in, in him and, all, and God and also our faith in, uh, in, in our church. Uh, so we offer these prayers to you that, and uh, we, we pray that we can be enlightened by what we learn. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So uh, slavery. John Wesley was an early and very vocal opponent of slavery. And he had written a, a few things shortly before his death, uh, especially when the United States, when, when uh, America was breaking off, he noticed the hypocrisy of, of a group of, of uh, colonies that were revolting because they, in the name of freedom, but who were also uh, holding slavery, especially since uh, there was a lot of work in England at the time to get rid of uh, the slave trade although that didn't happen until the early 1800s. <clears throat> um, but he wrote this in, uh, in his journal. I read a very difficult book published by an honest Quaker on that ex execrable, execrable sum of all villainies, commonly called the slave trade. I read of nothing like it in the heathen world, whether ancient or modern, and it infinitely exceeds in every instance of barbarity, whatever Christian slaves suffered in the Mohammedan countries. And then he wrote a pamphlet that he published about his thoughts upon slavery. And in there he wrote um, that, uh, uh, he wrote this prayer. O thou God of love, thou who art loving to every man and whose mercy is over all thy works, thou who art father of the spirits of all flesh and who art rich in mercy unto all, Thou who has mingled of one blood all the nations upon the earth, have compassion upon these outcasts of men who are trodden down as dung upon the earth. Arise and help these that have no helper, whose blood is, is spilt upon the ground like water. Are not these also the work of thine own hands and purchased of thy son's blood? O burst thou all their chains in as asunder, more especially the chains of their sins, Thou Savior of all, make them free, that they may be free indeed. He wrote a letter to uh, the English politician and uh, Anglican clergyman William Wilberforce, who fought uh, for slavery, uh, against slavery, uh, all his life, until it was finally abolished in 1833. <clears throat> and in the letter he wrote, uh, but, if you, but if God be for you, who can be against you? Are, you, are all of them together stronger than God? Oh, be not weary of well-doing. Go on in the name of God and in the power of his might till even have American slavery, the vilest that ever saw the sun, shall vanish before it. It being a law in all our colonies that the oath of a black against a white goes for nothing. What villainy is this? 
And uh, this is a drawing and engraving of uh, John Wesley writing that letter shortly before his death to William Wilberforce. So the early church was, uh, in, even in America, was against slavery, uh, the early Methodist church. Uh, they, uh, uh, and one of the, uh, you know, during this, the, uh, the abolition movement, we know the story of Harriet Tubman. Uh, we don't, we, we might not know is that she joined the, uh, our Methodist, uh, brothers and sisters at the AME Zion church later on. And she was a very, um, pervasive speaker, persuasive speaker. And she, uh, and she contributed her ability to conduct almost 300 people out of slavery into freedom in the North as um, the Holy Spirit guiding her whenever she felt, I don't know if you saw that movie, Harriet, I was out a couple of years ago. It's a very, it's a good movie, but it kind of depicts her having these sort of experiences. I guess she had a form of epilepsy and she would uh, faint when she felt that there was danger close by. And that way she knew, and she, but she was able, eventually able to control that. So she, when the feeling felt came by, she was able to direct people away from, uh, and so she was never caught. And then uh, there was another uh, woman who, had, uh, uh, who became a famous uh, female preacher in the AME, uh, and she traveled around, Jarena Lee, Reverend Jarena Lee. In the early days, in the 1700s, uh, Francis Asbury and Thomas Koch visited George Washington on Mount Vernon to ask him to abolish slavery. And, uh, and in the meeting, they had a good impression of George Washington, and they thought maybe they might be able to convince him. And they write, after dinner, we desired a private interview and, and opened to him the grand business on which we came, presenting to him our petition for the emancipation of the Negroes. I was loath to leave him, for I greatly love and esteem him, and if there was no pride in it, would say that we are of kindred, kindred spirits formed in the same mold. Oh, that God would give him the witness of his spirit. And in the Book of Discipline in 1785, um, they proclaimed uh, that uh, anybody who had slaves within 12 months must free them from the, uh, every slave in possession, in possession. And no person holding slaves shall in the future be admitted into the society or to the Lord's Supper till he previously complies with these rules concerning slavery. So early on, we had a tough stance against slavery. But un unfortunately, the economies in both the North and the South benefited from the institution of slavery. And gradually, the Methodists began to compromise on their original stand against slavery. From 1796 into 1844, the Book of Discipline records after every conference how they became more and they watered it down to the point where uh, they condoned it until it for they were forced, actually, uh, they were confronted by some some very uh, some Methodists uh, who were going to, were breaking off from the church in the north. And so, in the 1796, uh, they declared uh, that uh, slavery. What regulation shall be made against the emancipation of the cry of evil of African slavery? It said, "We declare that we are more than ever convinced of the great vile." of the African slavery, which still exists in these United States. And do most honest, earnestly recommend all the yearly conferences to make whatever regulations they judge proper in the present case respecting the admission of persons to official stations in our church. Uh, they retained this uh, in the 1800, and they said, when any traveling preacher becomes an owner of a slave or slaves, by any means, he shall forfeit their ministerial character in our church unless he execute, if it be practicable, a legal emancipation of such slaves, comfortable, com conformable to the laws of the state in which they live. So they started having to deal with these instances, even though they had this stance against slavery in certain areas in the South, there was still pressure and a lot of the members in the church were uh, slave owners. Um, all, in 1808, all the rules related to slavery, slaveholding among private members were struck out. 
the following sentences was substituted. The General Conference acknowledges each annual conference to form its own regulations relative to buying and selling slaves. So they're getting more and more watered down over the years. And then in 1816, they say, um, there no slaveholder shall be eligible to any official station in our church hereafter where the laws of the state in which he lives will admit of an emancipation and permit the, le the liberated slave to enjoy freedom. However, the people in the pews ignored the conference. And in 1820, the paragraph uh, leave, leaving to it the annual conferences to form their own regulations about buying and selling straight slaves was struck out. 1824, all preachers shall prudently enforce upon all members the necessity of teaching their slaves to read the word of God and to allow them time to attend upon public worship of God on our reg regular days of divine service. Our colored preachers and official members shall have all the privileges which are usual to others in the district and quarterly conferences where the usages uh, of, the, of the country do not forbid it. Providing elder may hold them, presiding elder may hold them a, a separate district conference where the number of colored preachers will justify it. So they're already segregating. Uh, also during this time, we had a lot of, the, we had the, the AME churches and the, the, the African Methodist churches forming because uh, in practice, there was discrimination in the, in, in the churches. In 1828, a resolution concerning a church trial of slaveholders who mistreat their slaves is tabled, no action taken in, sub in the subject of slavery. In 1832, the slavery question was not considered. And finally, in 1836, um, people had taken this matter to the annual conference and, and, and forced uh, uh, an abolition movements. And we'll, we'll talk about them a little, in a little bit, but in that conference, they say, they, the, the, uh, the Committee on Slavery Report, we deem it improper to further agitate the subject in the general conference at present. And the bishops and the pastoral, con con at the, the bishops pastoral address exhorted the church to abstain from all abolition movements and associations. Uh, during that conference, two New England conference members spoke strongly against slavery uh, and the conference generated enough votes to center these members and the conference also voted to condemn the practice in aboli of abolition. Now the South, the Southern arguments used to support the continuation of slavery. Uh, they claim that scripture tells of slaves more about scriptural reasons on the, uh, and there's more about it in the next slide. Slaves are better off as slaves than when free, that was their other comment, their other argument. Slaves have more material benefits than free laborers. Slavery is only true safeguard of a permanently Republican government. It is wrong to interfere in the civil and public political relations between master and slave as it, as it, as it exists in the slaveholding states in the union. And some of the arguments of scripture they claim that the Old Testament slavery was preached by the patriarchs and permitted to Israel in the Levitical Code. That primitive New Testament church had slaves in its membership. Uh, Paul sent uh, the slave Onesimus back to his master Philemon. However, they neglect to mention in that letter that Paul asks for that person, the, 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 the person that owned Onesimus. And, and not to mention that the fact that slavery at the time of the Romans was much different from slavery practice in America at the time, but we'll get to that in a minute. But Paul had written uh, for his freedom, uh, Onesimus' freedom. Paul enjoined, Paul enjoined slaves to be obedient to their masters, and slavery was God's punishment visited upon the sins of Ham in beholding the nakedness of their father Noah. So these were all the arguments that Southern preachers used to condone slavery. Um, one thing, though, that they neglected to mention was that the slavery of, of the time of the Romans was a lot different than the slavery, the chattel slavery practiced, at, as we know, as we look back at history on how we treated, how, how uh, slaveholders in the South had treated slavery, slaves, uh, as more like um, beasts of burden than as people. Uh, in, in, for example, in, in the, uh, if we look at a comparison, 
in the time of, of in the New Testament, there's uh, some people say that Luke might have been, as, who was a doctor, might have also been a slave to a rich person because he would have been, been providing service to the rich person. But the, the person would provide for them a life, you know, it wasn't, slavery was different. It was a different type of slavery and usually was brought on because they were um, in a captured land and, and brought as prisoners of war. It wasn't like a trade as we practiced in America. So there was a lot of differences, but those were neglected in the arguments. There was also a lot of effort to, um, they also took a lot of the parts of the Bible when they, when they pre presented uh, biblical teachings to the slaves, they took out key parts like the story of Exodus, uh, Moses leading the Jew, uh, people of Israel out of slavery in, in Jerusalem. Although the slave preachers, when they would go, they would have their services uh, at the, you know, the house where the, the slave master was, but they would also have secret meetings in the woods where they would teach people what the Bible says. And that's where we get some of the wonderful spiritual, uh, African-American spirituals like steal away and go down Moses and things like that, because they knew this story and, and they knew that they were, um, they knew uh, what, that they were on the right side. But unfortunately, the uh, establishment of the Methodist church, even in the Northern states, did not promote or did not push for what the, our early uh, Methodist founders, um, John Wesley, uh, Francis Asbury, Thomas Koch, a lot of these early preachers that pushed for the abolition of slavery. Nathan Bangs was a, um, was a, a very important person in the early church. He, was important, he um, published the, news, the magazine, The Christian Advocate, which was a, um, probably the most widely read periodical of the time in, in, in America. And he was, uh, also ran Methodist Publishing. A very, um, he also wrote a history of the Methodist Church. And so he, he sort of took a middle road here. He, 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 he believed that slavery was evil, uh, but, he all, but he also thought that uh, uh, to keep the church together, they needed to postpone, uh, you know, conversations about, uh, the conversations about this. And he criticized uh, Thomas Koch in his opposition to slavery uh, because he had, uh, uh, it says on one hand, uh, he objected to Thomas Koch's address in 1785, which called for the church to require slaveholders to free their slaves. He said, the slavery ex as it existed in all the Southern states makes the situation of a Methodist minister extremely unpleasant, especially when it is considered that the mistaken but well-meant zeal of Dr. Koch in his open opposition to slavery tended much to irritate the public mind on the subject. Uh, and one of the one of those people uh, that pushed against uh, hard within the Methodist Church against slavery and pushed for abolition was uh, a, a preacher who also became a presiding elder, Orange Scott. Who's, uh, and Nathan Bangs recorded what he said in the meeting. Uh, he said that uh, slavery is wrong, and he presented the argument that we must lay down the following proposition and make a choice that either slavery is wrong in some circumstances, in no circumstances, or in all circumstances. That slavery is morally wrong under all possible circumstances and in the course of his argument, so he made that argument and in the course of his argument contended that no circumstance whatever could alter or modify the sinful character of slavery, that it was wrong or a sin not to be tolerated under any circumstance whatsoever, either in or out of the church. And then he said it was against God and ought to be forthwith excommunicated. That anybody who held slaves uh, was sinner was a sinner against God and ought to forthwith be excommunicated from communion of the church unless they repented by any means uh, an unconditional surrender of their slaves without any regard to the 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 consequences of such a measure. So uh, he uh, so so. Nathan, as he was recording what, what was going on in this conference in his paper, he was, his argument was that Bang, uh, Orange Scott was pushing too hard uh, against slavery. 
And so in the debate in, uh, in uh, 1836, uh, members of the South got up and he said, it's probably false and calculated to make an impression to the injury of characters of some of the members engaged in the, in the foresaid discussion. And then one of the, and then the bishops held finally uh, by uh, the presiding bishop, uh, Bishop Elijah Heading, he declined to allow the appointment of, of a committee on slavery unless the conference would apply to the six conditions he named, which would uh, limit their, their ability. The conference did not comply and Heading made a long address in which he condoned slavery. Um, so, Orange Scott published his own Methodist periodical called Zion's Watchman. And it was, a, it was an abolition paper. Uh, and in it, he wrote, I have little hope that the church will ever be reformed in relation to slavery. And, uh, and so Wesley and anti-slavery, so the, he, he decided uh, that it was time to form a new denomination. So they met, the Wesleyan Anti-Slavery Convention was held in December 1842 to call to order a meeting at the Methodist Church in Andover, Massachusetts in 1843. And a grand rally was held in 1843 uh, in Utica, New York, where they decided to split from the church. So uh, this was all as a result of what happened in 1836 and again in 1840, uh, where in 1840, they, didn't e they wouldn't even listen to Orange Scott. So the church divided. Uh, he took off and formed the Wesleyan Methodist Church. He, uh, he was an ally with um, William Lloyd Garrison, who was a, another, um, who was an abol a famous abolitionist who wrote and friend of, of uh, a, a, and he was a friend of the abolition movement and Frederick Douglass. William Lord Garrison wrote that while other abolitions, abolitions of the time fa favored gradual emancipation, Clare Garrison argued for immediate and complete emancipation of all slaves. And Garrison replied that if this was true, then the Constitution, if the Constitution allowed slavery, that it should be burned. And he went on to say that the Constitution was a covenant of death and an argument with hell. Agreement. So it was very... Uh, uh, vocal resistance, and, and he formed uh, a friendship with, uh, with Orange Scott. Uh, and Orange Scott used to, used to uh, preach a lot at, at, at the abolition conventions. In 1840, an anti-slavery petition was presented with 10,000 signatures from church members. However, the majority attitude was opposed to any legislation that would affect the unity and peace of the church. And so in 1843, uh, the Wesleyan Methodist Church split off from the United Methodist Church, or I'm sorry, the Methodist Episcopal Church. And so this church exists today as the Wesleyan Church. Um, and uh, uh, in, I don't know if there's, if it's related to some of the, there's other West, there's free we Methodist Church and Wesleyan churches all around. So there's a, a variety of different Methodist churches uh, other, you know, Wesleyan churches out there. The Wesleyan church, I think, is pro primarily in the South and in the Midwest. But they also sent out missionaries to, uh, to uh, other places in the world. I, I think that the, maybe possibly the Tongan Methodist church might have been influenced by, by the Wesleyan church. And their first church was the Green Street Methodist. Uh, well, this is the, I'm sorry, this is where they... The, uh, so this is the, uh, the, the site of the 1844 General Convention. So with all these people splitting off, even though a lot of people had left the, um, the, the Methodist Episcopal Church, the Methodist Episcopal Church, uh, there was pressure among the Northern, more pressure among the Northern conferences to do something about, the, uh, about slavery. And, and this was all brought to head because a bishop, in the southern, in the Methodist Episcopal Church in the south, became a slave owner. He had uh, inherited a, a slave from his, his uh, aunt, I believe, and then also his wife 
owned slavery. And he decided he was not, he, he said that he had offered to emancipate uh, the slave that he had inherited, but she just, she didn't want to, she wanted to stay with him. And then also uh, he decided not to emancipate the slaves that he inherited from his, uh, uh, from his wife. So the Northern delegates called for Bishop Andrew to step down from the episcopacy because he owned slaves. And Bishop Andrew wrote a, a long um, reply, which talked about, which basically gave an excuse for why he was gonna hold on to them. We won't get into it, but, but Bishop Andrew, the fact that Bishop Andrew held on to his slaves, um, this caused, this brought this issue to a head because now not only was uh, were they putting off this decision? Now they had a bishop that was was a slaveholder. Um, so uh, this caused a, um, a, a arguments. Uh, the, the New England caucus insisted that if Bishop Andrew were allowed to stay in office for more than four years, their conference would succeed from the church. Uh, bishop Heading. Uh, Though he removed his name from the recommendation, Bishop Heading was the bishop of the of this New England the New England area, and the conference tabled the bishop's proposals to wait for four more years. Uh, well, and then uh, a Southern bishop, uh, William Caspers of the South Carolina, proposed that the church divide into two administrative areas, each having its own general conference and and bishops, but both conferences holding to the present constitution and discipline. And then uh, in the succeeding days, as the argument went on, the general conference decided to draw up a plan for separation. James B. Finney was a delegate uh, of the general conference. Uh, he offered the Finney, Finley resolution that called for the resignation of Bishop James O. Andrew the adoption of this resolution led to the separation of the Methodist Episcopal Church in the two denominations because the South rejected it. Um, Finley had served as a frontier residing elder missionary to the uh, Hawaiian Dot Indians and a powerful camp meeting preacher and author of several books on Methodism in the frontier. So the response of the Southern delegates, they pointed out that Bishop Andrew had violated no law or rule of the church. He had not been charged with any offense, and the Northern delegates, by force of members, had set aside church law. The resolution set a precedence that, which subjected any bishop at any time to the will or caprice of a majority of the General Conference, not only without law, but in defiance of the restraints of, and the provision of the law. So they based their decision on existing church law. And so uh, they had a vote, and in the conference, 110 voted, 110 to 68 voted to ask Andrew to cease his Episcopal functions so long as he remained a slaveholder. Mm -hmm. And then that vote uh, caused the, the Southern Church to break off and, um, and adopt a plan for separation. And the South was organized in Louisville, Kentucky. So the plan for separation have some very interesting things that uh, I don't kind of are similar to <laughs> the plan of separation uh, that we're thinking of uh, uh, doing now. We'll talk about this more next week, but it's very interesting how history uh, repeats itself. <laughs> uh, here it says that the uh, any bit any bishop was free to join the newly formed southern branch of the church and that all property of the Methodist Episcopal Church within the limits of the Southern Branch would be transformed to, to the Methodist Episcopal Church. So they came up with a plan to allow them to retain their property. These are two issues that we're talking about today. Uh, how are we gonna go about splitting the church if we split up into two different denominations? Well, we have precedence for this in our church. And so the plan of separation was drawn up uh, in 1848 the General Conference of the Methodist Church uh, repudiated the plan uh, for the, for forcing the Methodist Episcopal Church to go to the Supreme Court to secure its equal equity in the Board of Concerns and other church interests. 
So this was, they wanted, this was probably about the property. Nowadays, um, one of the things that has changed uh, is that we have our own judicial council. Uh, and I don't even think the, United, the Supreme Court would hear an argument within the Methodist Church <laughs> anymore. But back then the Methodist Church was powerful enough to, to do it. And so they, they, held, they held a Supreme Court meeting. <clears throat> okay, so, so for a period of time until I believe it was 1934, the, we had a Methodist uh, Episcopal uh, Church and a Methodist Episcopal Church South, which is where we get Southern Methodist University. We also have a number of churches. Sometimes you notice we had, we had a number of Methodist churches that are very close to each other. A lot of them were Northern Methodist and Southern Methodist churches. For example, in the city of Tulsa, uh, there was a Boston Avenue UMC, which is on, and uh, there was another uh, first UMC of Tulsa, which are across the street from each other. And so you had competing churches. This is the same thing in California. Some of the Methodist churches in California were part of the Methodist Episcopal South originally. Uh, but it, I'm sorry, it was in 1939 that, that they merged again. And then also they joined it up with the Methodist Protestant Church, which had, which had split up or split from the church earlier. Uh, and so um, then we had so then we had the Methodist Episcopal Church again. And one of the things uh, that they uh, decided in that church that they had multiple that they had a separate African American jurisdiction, uh, equal law and clergy representation in the annual conference and general conferences. They retained the bishops and launched a council of bishops. And then they came up with the judicial council to deal with um, uh, church law issues. And that's the, the judicial council uh, had met earlier to, to deal with uh, uh, a lot of the things that have been going on in our, in, in our last general conference over, um, over the, uh, the traditional plan and, and also now uh, uh, there's another plan for separation that we'll talk about next week. Okay, so uh, any uh, thoughts or any, any um, idea or opinions or any thoughts on, on, on what we discussed about uh, the church today then and, and how it might uh, apply to our church today? It's, uh, I will point out that the Methodist Church wasn't the only denomination at the time that was going this, through this kind of thing. This was in all churches, which was why we had a lot of segregated churches uh, and still do today um, because of the legacy of, of our churches. And it's very sad when you look at how the Methodist Church was planned originally and how we took a strong stand against racism and we wanted it to, to be a church uh, in unity to all that over time, uh, we let these divisions, uh, these, these different ideas divide the church. Is there still an AME church? Yes. They're a separate denomination. Uh, I, I went to a seminary with a number of AME pastors uh, in the church. Uh, we're very similar in a lot Oops. of our ways. Oops. In a lot of our church. You're frozen. Uh-oh. Can you hear me? Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Can you hear me? Ah, oh, shoot. Everybody's frozen. Sorry. Right. Yeah. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Back again. Hi, John. Maybe. Uh-oh. I did not. I can't hear you. John, muted. you're muted. Good. Sorry. There we go. There, go. there we go. You're back. Hey, babe. Okay. <laughs> uh, that's an interesting comment, John. <laughs> oh. All right. So we move on for, uh, to the uh, uh, this story of women in the church, which follows a similar trajectory, although uh, progress was made a lot sooner, <clears throat> I think, 
Um, then uh, in, our, in the method, in the, uh, the uh, race, racial issues that we're dealing with still today. Okay, so back in the early days of the church, the, uh, the, uh, the pastor's wife role was very important to the, uh, the community, right? The, yeah, the uh, traveling pastors and the pastor's wives oftentimes were, uh, you know, either they traveled with them or if they had to raise a family, they had to, raise, they had to uh, take care of, the, of, their, uh, of their families. And also they would, as they would travel around with their, along with their, hold on a second. Oh, you can't see this, can you? No. Nope. Sorry about that. <laughs> I lost my share when I. Uh... And you unfroze? We when I unfroze, yeah, okay. Oops, there we go. Um, there we go. There it is. Yeah. Uh, the early roles of the of, of women in the church uh, was around the role of the pastor's wife. Uh, oftentimes, they would be focus focus on uh, the needs of the poor in their community. They also struggled too because they didn't really make that much of a salary, and oftentimes they had to travel along to their their home. The homes of the circuit riders were not very uh, well kept up. And also, um, you know, there were a lot of times this life was hard on the, on the traveling preacher. And there were a lot of, uh, of, of uh, widows uh, of, of these pastors. So it became a concern for the church, um, even in the time of Francis Asbury. He started a, um, a might fund, a widow's might fund, to support the, uh, the Methodist women uh, and uh, the, uh, the wives of the pastors and the lay preachers. Also, um, while you had traveling pastors, the churches had lay, lay pastors that would preach while the, uh, while the ordained pastor was, was not there. So uh, while they, as they did this, they started the, those pastors started leading the Bible classes in the parsonage. And that's where you started having Bible study. So they moved away from these class meetings and they would have the pastor uh, or, then, or the pastor's wife oftentimes um, lead these Bible studies. And so they started uh, Sunday schools and, and, and education became an important part because there were, there were no public schools during that time. So a lot of the early schools developed within the church. Hmm. And also run by uh, mostly by the women in the church. And uh, there's some examples of some church buildings. The, um, in 1841, the Methodist Episcopal Church began the Ladies' Repository, a, a journal for Christian women. The, the editorial po uh, policy sought to explicate the religious duties of women to God and other human beings, assist in doing these duties, illustrate virtue through uh, the biography biographies of fine women, discuss biblical texts, and discourage domestic and encourage, I'm sorry, domestic, domestic economy. Um, some of the early, uh, we'll go through some of the early leaders in this church with Elizabeth uh, Greenfield, who started the, uh, the Elizabeth Female Academy, the earliest mm -hmm. church supported school for women in America uh, or in the world for that matter. And it was open uh, in Washington, Mississippi. In 1836, uh, the legislature of, the Georgia, of Georgia founded the Georgia Female College in Meka, the world's first college for women to grant the Bachelor of Arts degree. And this school became under Methodist sponsorship in 1839. And it was the same, the name was changed to Wesleyan Female College in 1845, as, as was the, uh, and, and so there were a number of Methodist colleges that started uh, programs like this. And then uh, we mentioned uh, Jarena Lee. It was a preacher encouraged by Francis Asbury, uh, but she was not supported by the MEC, the Methodist Episcopal Church. So she joined and preached in the AME Church when that was founded. But the AME did not adore, uh, ordain her either. And now uh, a name you pro you're probably familiar with, uh, Phoebe Palmer. I'm going to show a short video about her. Sure. Thank you. 
Okay, do you see this? Is that Phoebe Palmer yeah. has been yeah, called now. an early feminist, a theologian, and a humanitarian. A legend in her own time, says historian Fred Day. There's um, a great story related to her travels as an evangelistic speaker. She is riding a steamer and the boiler in the steamer catches fire. The ship is on fire and there is great panic. And she calmed the crowd by leading a hymn sing. The story goes that when the ship docked in New York, one of the passengers was heard to say, thank God for the Methodists. In the 1800s, when only <laughs> men were preachers, Palmer led weekly Bible studies, published books, and preached at more than 300 revival camp meetings. She experienced and believe in the direct calling and work of the Holy Spirit in and through a person's life that would not allow them to keep silent. Personal tragedy shaped Palmer's faith. She lost three of her six children with husband Walter Palmer, one in a fire that ignited when an oil lamp fell into the crib with the infant. She was a person that knew great pain and hurt and tragedy in her life, but it was uh, her experience of the power and presence of God's love in her life that was a source for her overcoming. Palmer was key in establishing New York's Methodist Five Points mission. On the site of an old brewery, the ministry brought the healing presence of the Holy Spirit to residents in one of New York's poorest neighborhoods. She was the developer of what was called the Tuesday meeting for the promotion of holiness. Perfect love, she says, issues forth in passion for lives that serve humanity. An interesting footnote, Palmer's daughter and namesake, Phoebe Palmer Knapp, followed in her mother's footsteps of service to the Methodist Church, composing over 500 hymn tunes, including the music for Fanny Crosby's Blessed Assurance. Okay, so Phoebe Palmer, uh, as, it, as we mentioned, led to the Tuesday evening ministries in New York, which were very well attended. And she's uh, um, credited for helping start the holiness movement. Um, and and uh, she wrote a, a classic on it called, and I read this part of this in, in my in seminary, The Way of Holiness. And she preached uh, more kind of experiential uh, faith. I think it's on the next slide. Oh, no. Uh, so a more experiential faith um, and that was uh, an expressive faith. And it caused some conflict within the Methodist Church, uh, which is why I think the Holiness Churches split off from the Methodist Churches later on. And it was from this Holiness Movement that we have the Pentecostal Churches today. Um, but, mm -hmm. uh, but she was a, a, a you know, she was a lifelong Methodist and, and started that, that holiness movement. And she believed in, she, she um, emphasized a theology of, of complete sanctification. She believed that that could, be, that could be experienced in our lifetime, that God can change us, can change the heart, and that, and that we can experience uh, the fruit of that uh, through fruits of the Spirit, um, you know, through uh, ex ex feeling the Holy Spirit, felt presence of the Holy Spirit. So that was um, Phoebe Palmer and and, her, and uh, her husband started that movement. Uh, she, again, though, even though she preached often, she was ordained, but she never, she wasn't ordained, but she never really sought ordination. Eliza Garrett uh, of Chicago 
was a philanthropist and she gave a financial gift uh, with, and, and started the, uh, the endowment for Garrett uh, Biblical Institute, which is one of our, uh, our key Methodist uh, seminaries. So those are early women uh, in the church. Uh, none of these women, uh, ex except for maybe uh, Jerisa Lee, had, had sought ordination. Uh, uh, but in 1866, uh, they, uh, as more women were preaching, they sought to be, and, and educated at, in seminaries, they sought to be ordained in the church. And so here's a, a timeline uh, that we'll go over um, of, of you know, in 1866, we had um, uh, the, uh, the Episcopal Church South agreed to allow lay people, lay men, as delegates. Before that time, it was only preachers and bishops and, and that sort of thing, only clergy. And in 1866, they allowed uh, men to sit as delegates. In 1872, the Methodist Episcopal Church allowed lay men to, uh, to sit. But, but in, in 1872, uh, we also... They also pressed for um, inclusion in, of, of women. In 1888, the Methodist Episcopal Church refused a second time to seat Frances Willard as a delegate because she was a woman. In 1892, Thank Methodist you, Protestants you. permit women delegates. Uh, in 1893, the uh, United Brethren permitted women delegates. And uh, in 1922, uh, the, Methodist, the Methodist Episcopal South sits female delegates. And finally, in 1956, we had our first woman ordained as clergy. So it took quite a while to get to that point. Uh, one of the early, though, one of the early ministry opportunities for women was the deaconess movement. Uh, starting in 1811, uh, uh, Bishop Simpson had visited Germany and noticed uh, this strong auxiliary group meeting in the, among the German Methodists. And uh, Lucy Ryder Meyer uh, started the movement here in the United States at the Chicago Training School uh, for our mission and social service and the Deaconess Order in the Methodist Episcopal Church. And so uh, Bishop... Uh, Mills Thoburn supported this movement and he pressed the 1888 General Conference to establish the Office of Deaconess in the church. But ironically, the same year, uh, the General Conference denied the right of women to sit as conference delegates. So they started a delegate, I mean, a, an order uh, for women's service, but they didn't allow women to sit as delegates. And so there was a, a, a training school in Chicago the Elizabeth Gamble Deaconess Home and Missionary Training School in Cincinnati, and the Scarrett Bible School in Nashville. So what this, these group, this group did was they would set up um, orphanages, they'd serve in orphanages, in schools, uh, provide help to the poor. It was uh, an order of, of women and they, had, uh, they would dress in a distinctive garb with a plain navy dress or black dress with a white ruffle. <laughs> Here's a picture of, of some African-American um, women who, who, uh, who were, went to the Deaconess Training School. And the Methodist Episcopal Church approved the Office of Deaconess in 1902. With Methodists leading the way towards the end of the 19th century, many American Protestant denominations also developed the Office of a Deaconess. Uh, and in 1908, um, they, uh, in the, book, the discipline says that released from the other care, you give yourselves without reservation to the service to Christ. Now solemnly set yourself apart for the, ser for the special service. You are to work for Christ only. To, you are to minister to the poor, visit the sick, pray with the dying, care for the orphan, seek the wandering, comfort the sorrowing, save the sinning, and ever be ready to take up any other duty for which willing hands cannot otherwise be found. Performing many, many of the duties, sometimes uh, pastoral duties, to, uh, to, uh, to these people. So what did the men do? Yeah, good question. 
Um, you know, they. Uh, <laughs> women are doing everything. What the men do? <laughs> I think that's the case today. I mean, if you look at the difference between. <laughs> yeah, same as always. <laughs> I mean, within the church, anyway, if you look at the United Methodist Women's Organization versus the United Methodist Men's Organization, the United Methodist Women's Organization is much more powerful. The United Methodist Women's Organization founded UMCOR uh, and founded all these different release, relief agencies. They focused on missionary work. So they were really the people going out there. And, and, uh, and I mean, not to say that there weren't obviously men and oftentimes pastors, but um, still, uh, a lot of these organizations, a lot of the movements of the time were led by women, which also is no coincidence that the, um, uh, the voting voters rights movement, a lot of women in the church were part of that because of their, you know, they, they had been out there in the world making, yeah, doing a lot uh, for people. Okay, so over 20 years, Deaconess Movement consecrated about a thousand women for the work. Uh, we have, we still have the deaconess. It's called deaconess and home missioner. So both men and women can serve on this, in this committee. So that's, that is, uh, it, it, it's, it's a order within the church and you can be ordained. We ordained uh, a deaconess here in this church to work with um, Filipino migrants uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, and, and so we, so she, she, that's her calling to work. It's almost kind of like a deacon uh, order as what deacons do now, only they focus specifically on bringing the church out there into the world. And uh, the Methodism owes to the deaconess movement a vision for the women's ministries in the church and a conviction that the gospel must be expressed in the social arena. Running low on time. So I'm gonna show you a video of, on uh, Francis Willard and some of the leaders, early leaders in the women leaders in the Methodist Church. I started in seventeen. Shares. Francis Willard is a person who brought the involvement of women in and through the Methodist Church very much into the foreground. Church historian Francis Willard is a person who brought the involvement of women in and through the Methodist Church very much into the foreground. Church historians have called this red-headed reformer the most widely known and loved Methodist woman since Susanna Wesley. In the late 1800s, Frances Willard was a professor and dean of women at a time few females went to college. But she may be best remembered for her 19 years as president of the Women's Christian Temperance Union in the U.S., which sought to ban the sale of alcohol. <laughs> Willard saw men as the victims of the temptation of liquor, but believed the ultimate victims were women and children. They weren't concerned about abstinence from alcohol for abstinence sake. Uh, they saw that the church had a message to proclaim to people that mothers and women needed to speak up about because of how social conditions in that time were really ruining people's lives. We remember Francis Willard only as a great temperance worker, would be remembered for a saying like, lips that touch liquor will never touch mine. I think that that really minimizes the extent of what Francis Willard and other women like her in that period of time were concerned about. The Temperance Union became the largest women's organization in the U.S. 150,000 members strong, the association moved beyond prohibition to argue for an eight-hour workday, raise the age of consent for girls, and secure the right of women to vote. In the Methodist Church, Willard also pushed the envelope. 
She was actually originally elected to General Conference before women could be elected. They had made plans to see if General Conference would seat them. Willard didn't get to challenge General Conference that year. She was called home to care for her mother. Never married, she traveled extensively in her work. She had a small desk. We think of a laptop computer nowadays. She had like the original laptop. When the train would get to a train station, if she needed to send off a telegram, she would jump off the train, quickly give the paper to the telegraph operator, and then get back on and continue on to her next destination. Willard wrote several books, including one on learning to ride a bike after age 50. She says riding, learning to ride a bicycle is a whole lot like learning to live life. You've got to keep it pointed in the right direction, and every now and then you've got to give it a little kick with your feet as you're pedaling. Um, otherwise, the wheel will wobble and you'll fall off in the ditch. Willard remained president of the Temperance Union until her death in 1898. Although she did not live to see it, her influence helped secure the passage of the 18th and 19th Amendments, Prohibition and Women's Suffrage. This faithful Methodist was the first woman honored with a place in the National Statuary Hall of the U.S. Capitol, setting her legacy in stone for future generations. Frances Willard embodies that Wesleyan sense of practical divinity, that you just don't go to church to hear a religious message, but the religious message you hear changes not only your life, but changes the life of the world around you. So the uh, first need to raise the volume. I'm sorry. Oh, raise volume. Okay, sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's talk it away from it. Okay. Um, so the first Methodist, uh, the first Protestant church, uh, Methodist Protestant church, the Methodist Protestant church, not the Methodist Episcopal Church, seated its first female delegate in 1892. Um, the ordination of women in the Methodist Episcopal Church came slowly. Um, early Bishop, uh, bishops as Coke, Asbury, Watcote, and McKendry, George Roberts, Solon, Hetty, and Andrews did not encourage women to engage in the ministry of preaching. Yet in the local congregations, Methodist women did much of the work, and some women expanded their ministry as class leaders to include officiating at public services and uh, in long intervals between these visits, the traveling preachers, women's led worship service. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. All right. Move through a couple of these. Um, these are some of the uh, of the of the women that uh, early women preachers, Margaret Van Cotte. I'm not, so much to cover. I'm not gonna. I'm gonna skip through a couple of these. Ann Oliver, um, within the Methodist Church. Uh, so Ann Oliver uh, had gone to Boston University uh, School of Theology, and uh, she was a distinguished preacher. She earned this distinction of de delivering one of the senior honor orations at the commencement exercises and the first Methodist woman to receive a seminary degree, graduating with honors in, in 1876. But it would take another 75 years before the Methodist Church would ordain women. Amanda Smith was a powerful preacher uh, whose ministry took her to know to some of the most well-known houses of worship in America. It said that when she spoke, she could see the Holy Spirit, you could, she could see the Holy Spirit fall on people just like you would sprinkle hot coals on them. <laughs> Anna Howard Shaw, uh, was a graduate of Theological, Theological School of Boston, and she asked this Bishop Andrew for his counsel regarding her and Anna, Anna Oliver. The bishop told the women that, that women had no place in ordained ministry, and if they wanted ordin ordination, 
they should leave the Methodist Episcopal Church. And so they did, and they joined the Methodist Protestant Church, which was an, off, which was an earlier offshoot. The Methodist Protestant Church moved faster at, at, a, at a faster pace than, they, uh, than the other two branches of Methodism. Uh, in 1866, the Northern Indiana Conference of the Methodist Protestant Church ordained Helen Davidson as a deacon, the first woman ordained as the, uh, in that church's history. And then later, um, uh, Anna Howard Shaw was, was, uh, was ordained as well. And, and a quote from her, on Monday morning when the conference met in its final business session, my case was reopened and I was eventually called before the members to answer questions. Some of these were extremely interesting and several other of the episodes that occurred were very amusing. One old gentleman I can see as I write, he was greatly excited and he led the opposition by racing up and down the aisles, quoting from the scriptures to prove his case against women ministers. And so uh, she was the first woman ordained as, uh, as an elder in the Methodist Pro Protestant Church uh, and the first woman in mainline Methodism, ordained in mainline Methodism. Okay, uh, so we will go. In 1889, the, the United Brethren Church approved licensing of, of ordained women. In the conference, Ella uh, uh, Niswanger of the Central Conference in Illinois in 1889 was licensed as a pastor. Was there a, a relationship between the Methodist Church and the uh, UBC at the time? Uh, only, uh, I think, a, a, a communion, but they weren't part of the same church. They didn't join until 1968. Okay. The Methodist Protestant Church joined in uh, 1939, and that's kind of sad because uh, I mean, if they had Methodist women, Protestant, Methodist, and Methodist Protestant women preaching at that church, the Methodist Episcopal Church didn't allow women to be ordained at that time. So we're not, I'm not sure. I'd have to look up and see if they had any at the time. So the first uh, woman ordained in uh, the United Methodist or the Methodist Episcopal Church uh, was uh, Maud Jensen in the Central Pennsylvania Conference. And that was in 1956. And uh, Georgia Harkness was the first woman to teach at an American seminary. She wrote 30 books. She was widely acclaimed as a female Methodist theologian and received many honorary degrees. And she carried her Methodist message to the Methodists in Japan, where she also taught. And our first Methodist bishop was Marjorie Matthews who became a United Methodist Bishop at the age of 64 in 1980. Today, we have 17 female bishops, uh, 14 in the United States, and over a dozen retired female bishops. Okay, so let's have a couple of questions. I know we're running a little bit late, but I'd like to have a couple of questions here. The Methodist Church was like many denominations in, in America. The struggle with and they struggled with and failed to counter the sins of racism, sexism, and slavery. But those who were who were expelled uh, or compelled to leave the church were vindicated by history. Can you envision a envision a scenario where our church could have come out of on the right side of history? What could have happened differently? Do you think in the church, or what is it inevitable in this country? Was it this is just a long process? That had to happen to get to the point where we where we are today. I'm going to close this. So, what do you think? Did we have to go through all that mess, or could we have done something a little different? <laughs> yeah, probably. Otherwise, we'd have been on the fringes and maybe not been able to reach out and bring other people in. I I wish that were not would not have been the case, but I suspect that that's a reality. I, I, that's definitely how it bore out. I mean, it was the, the fringes. I remember when the uh, Wesleyan church, people in the Wesleyan church broke off 
uh, from the Methodist Episcopal Church that had uh, spurred people into action and then that, that they pushed for abolition, or at least they pushed to, uh, to not condone slavery among them, Bishop and not allow Bishop Andrew to have slaves and that split the church. Um, and then again, constant pushing from people pushing the envelope, uh, all the women that pushed the envelope mm -hmm. to get their degrees, to become very accomplished, great speakers and, and preachers to finally, um, you know, change history. Yeah, it seems like the thread of social justice really comes through the Methodist movement, whether, and, and a lot of it seems to have come from within as opposed to outside. So the Methodist women and others who were progressive, I guess, would be the term at the time, really helped move um, a lot of social justice in, in the United States as a result of the preaching and agitating and that sort of thing, being abolitionists and reformers. Yeah, and it changed the country. I mean, a lot of these, Methodist church was very influential in those days. It was the largest Protestant denomination in the country. Uh, and so when the temperance movement obviously got the uh, uh, prohibition uh, through, <laughs> Uh, but they also um, put the women's right to vote in 1920 and child labor laws in the progressive era, all these things that came from the church. We'll talk a little bit more about that and the social doctrine next week, but uh, it is interesting. Also the missionary movement and this, uh, a lot of the good things we do in the world when we send out missionaries to go out and as doctors and, and people as teachers, a lot of, they were sponsored by uh, the United Methodist women and historically, the United Methodist women in every church is to manage the missionaries that the church is church sponsors. So um, I think that's very, it's a very important legacy that I think we still should honor as, as, as uh, within the church. Do you think it was because there weren't opportunities outside of the church for some of those um, jobs, fields? And then those kind of been intersected and because of the agitation of some of the church, then it moved social policy and it moved governmental policy along as well. I think so, yeah. I think the church gave an opportunity for people. Now it's different, right? Where it seems like the church now needs to, is kind of drawn out away from a lot of that stuff. And, um, and I think we need to go back into it for our own sake you know, yeah. then, then, then for the sake of the world, I mean, it is for the sake of the world. I mean, I think if, we, if you believe that the Christian message is important for our society, I think it's important for the church to return back to its social principles out in, in the world, as well as, um, you know, we moved in the 20th century, churches have moved and become more um, individual, you know, talk, we dealt more with, which, which is important as, as, uh, as uh, Adam Hamilton was talking about, the uh, personal evangelism and social, uh, the social and social uh, uh, responsibilities. Those are two sides that we we can uh, we can use in the church. Okay, I'm not going to go into this. I was planning to talk about a couple of the scripture passages. I'm not going to read them out right now, but if you want to look at them later, that were used. Uh, and they're still used by some churches today uh, to, uh, to, um, to prevent women from being preachers are from 1 Timothy chapter 2 and also from 1 Corinthians chapter 14, where they talk about the role of women. I'll, I'll read the one from 1 Corinthians. It says, as in all churches of the saints, women should be silent in the churches where they are not permitted to speak, but should be subordinate as the law also says. If there's anything they desire to know, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church, or did the word of God originate with you, or are, all only, are, or are you the only ones it has reached? Now, it's interesting, this particular quotation is, is it's in parentheses in, in 1 Corinthians, and it, if you look at it, if you go back and read it, it almost seems like it's sort of interjected in there, right? 
uh, <laughs> later on doesn't quite fit the flow of, of, what's, of what Paul is talking about. And the other interesting thing is that Paul obviously relied on women in the church. Uh, he had, uh, they, he speaks of Phoebe, who was a deacon uh, in, uh, in the town of Centurea, uh, which is close to Corinth in Romans 16, verse 1 and 2. He commends her. Priscilla, who worked with Aquila in, uh, and Paul in Corinth, and that's in Romans, same chapter 16. Chloe, who uh, probably ran a church uh, in the house of Corinth. And also, as we said, John, asked, John Wesley, Francis Asbury, also encouraged women to preach. So you know, there's, that, there's that kind of debate and dialogue. I think the United Methodist Church over the years had realized you know, that this is, the, the scripture is, is mixed on this topic, and women are gifted <laughs> to preach. I've had my previous uh, pastor at the, the church I was at before, I learned many different things. My, also, my, my mentor here is also a very good woman pastor. So, you know, it, it, these are the things that churches are still, unfortunately, dealing with some churches. Uh, not so much our church, but, um, but still, actually, in some churches uh, in southern districts, it's hard for a woman to be assigned as an elder in a church. A lot of them go or are, are moved into deacon roles. I have friends that can't be... A, you know, can't get into a, a big church because you know the, uh, the they won't be assigned there so we're still struggling with it struggle continues okay so uh, next week we'll we're going to talk a little bit there are some parallels this week with what happened in the united methodist church when we split uh with the southern church with what we're about to do in the methodist church next year very similar in many ways, in the ways that we're talking about how we're going to divide the churches for different reasons, um, you know, and, and um, it's not, you know, it's not like it's, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about what the issues are next week a little bit, and we'll talk about uh, why they're, um, I don't, actually, we're not going to, I'm sorry, I have to repeat, we're not going to do it next week. I'm going to be out of town, so we're gonna, it's going to be the week after that. I apologize. So I'll send out a note for that, but um, yeah, uh, but, but we'll deal with, that'll be the, the final class on the 20th century. I don't know, maybe we can extend it for another discussion the following day, because it's, it's very, it's a lot. I mean, there's a lot there. Uh, it's what we're decided, planning to do. So maybe that's another, maybe we'll just have two more weeks, because I think covering the 20th century and what we're planning to do in the 20th century are two different things and what the state of the church is and what it could look like after. My personal conviction is, the churches, both of them, uh, the, 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 the Global Methodist Church, which is the one, the new one that they're proposing, and the United Methodist Church will both thrive. And uh, if we continue to, you know, to live up to our principles and our, and our heritage and also preach the gospel. So, okay, well, any other thoughts? Okay, let me uh, share the, uh, our final prayer. Come, let us use the grace divine and, and with all one accord in a perpetual covenant, join ourselves to Christ our Lord. Give up ourselves through Jesus's power, his name to glorify and promise in this sacred hour for God to live and die. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, John. Thank you. Aloha. Bye. 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 Thank you, Dave. Aloha. Yeah. Aloha. Thank All right. Aloha. Aloha. Thanks. Bye, guys. <laughs>